let me please uh, introduce Lulu, Lourdes Zamora. Lourdes Zamora, uh, she holds a bachelor's in renewable energy engineering for the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She has experience in the wind resource assessment. In, 19, in 2019, she began a master in energy engineering also at the NAM. She developed the project Wind Power Temporal and Spatial Complementarity and this relationship with the regional electricity demand in Mexico. She has been collaborating with the University of Reading to develop these projects relating to assessing the accuracy of wind speed data sets from models and reanalysis. And also in recent years, she has been teaching uh, assistant of the UNAM in applied mathematical subjects as uh, also she is working in the renewable energy company in the business, business development, uh, development area. So as you may notice, Lulu Lourdes is, uh, um, uh, she, she's, she's having a lot of work in this field of uh, wind power. So, um please uh are you ready lulu can you yes. open okay so i won't take you any more time welcome you and thank you very much thank you thank you Svaldu. i'm really happy to be here today and hello everyone hello to all the attendees i hope you are all well so yes today's presentation is part of my mastery thesis project which, as Osvaldo mentioned, is titled Wind Power Temporal and Spatial Complementarity and its Relation with the Regional Electricity Demand in Mexico. In this presentation, I will talk about the wind energy generation section. Well, this project was carried out under the supervision of Osvaldo Rodriguez, and it is a collaboration with Oscar Martinez from the University of Reading and Hannah Plumfield from the University of Reading, but also now from the University of Bristol. So as an introduction, this project is related on one hand wind, with wind resource assessment and in the other hand with the use of wind energy to meet electricity demand. Uh, wind energy assessment is important because it helps to determine where it's convenient to develop wind projects by describing the wind speeds and wind energy generation. To do our wind resource assessment, at least one year of wind speed values is needed, but sometimes we don't have the data because it is hard and expensive to get, but reanalysis offers free data of different variables, one of them wind speed for all the world. Then about using renewable energies to satisfy the demand, there is, kind of a problem attached to it, which is the variability, but increasing the flexibility of the grid could decrease this problem. There are high cost techniques to do this, like energy storage, and also low cost techniques as a more accurate assess of the resources and forecasting and coordinate with neighboring connected grids. And these last techniques are the ones that we studied and I related with the wind resource assessment because we needed to describe the wind and then depending on the characteristics, select the best sites and select which ones to interconnect. So we can say that this part of the project divides in two spheres, each of them with its own objectives. And the first sphere is the input of the second one. This first sphere is the assessment of ERA-5 analysis data to evaluate wind resources. And to understand better why it is the input, let's talk about the data. The data that we use for this part of the project are a time series of observed wind speeds from 30 sites located across Mexico and are presented with circles in this figure. These data were obtained from two projects, seven sites from the Mexican Wind Atlas and 23 sites from the action plan to eliminate barriers um, to the development of wind power generation in Mexico. Both projects were developed from the, were developed by the Electrical Research Institute, the IIE, now the 
National Institute of Electricity and Clean Energies. As we commonly call it in Spanish, INEL. And also the wind project was supported by United Nations. The data of both of them is reported every 10 minutes and the year and measurement height depend on the site. Some sites report the wind speed for 2005, others 2006, 2007, 2018, and 2019 at one, two, or four heights, among which are measures at 10, 50, 30, it's different for every site except for the seven sites of the Mexican wind atlas. For those, the wind speed is always reported at 20, 40, 60, and 80 meters. We also use time series for from era five at 100 meters and the power curve of the Vestas V90 wind turbine, which has a rated power of two megawatts. About era five that Hannah mentioned it and well, we also use it. Era five is analysis data. Analysis are constructed using global numerical weather prediction models that simulates observations from various sources, including land surface stations, buoys, rides on the balloons, aircrafts, and satellites. Era five, um, I guess is the newest, latest climate analysis produced by the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. There are other analyses from this center like ERA 15, ERA 40, and ERA INRIM, but ERA 5 improves the grid resolution. It's higher, it has a, a horizontal resolution of 30 kilometers and other characteristics about it is that it resolves the atmosphere in 127 levels up to a height of 80 kilometers. The output frequency is hourly and it offers information from 1950 to the present five days ago. So, um, before going in the method about how we evaluate the accuracy of ERA-5, I um, want to mention that, yes, at the beginning, I mentioned the wind resource assessment, but we didn't, didn't use this data to see which sites are potential. Spoiler, some of them are not. We use this data to assess the wind resource, but focusing on using the results to then compare the results obtained with observations and with ERA-5 to evaluate the accuracy of ERA-5. And then with the results obtained, we can use ERA-5 to detect potential sites around these zones or similar zones or to use the data for other analysis. That is this case in which we use the data to analyze the, the wind resource complementarity. So yeah, now moving to the method. The first step was to have the time series um, with the same timestamp and at the same height, because as I mentioned, the observations are reported every 10 minutes and era five wind speed is reported every hour at 100 meters and the height of the observation is different. So the first step was to make the time series comparable. And for the observations, uh, it was modified the time step by average from 10 minutes to an hour. Then the time series were extrapolated to 100 meters, the same height as era five, using the power law. Depending on the number of known heights, it was used either a constant or a dynamic value of alpha this one, which is a representation of the thickness of the velocity boundary layer. Then the era five data was interpolated to the study sites because when era five data is downloaded, you download like a, a domain. And well, this domain is useful if you want to see like the map of, of any country or any region. 
but we need time series of discrete points. So we interpolate the, the grid um, for the specific points. And then once we have the time series, we adjust them to the corresponding time zone because ERA-5 reports the data on UTC-0. And here in Mexico, we have four time zones. We only use three because we don't have sites in Quintana Roo, but Quintana Roo is UTC minus five. And then the states colored in yellow are UTC minus six. The ones colored in green are UTC minus seven and Baja California is UTC minus eight. And also the, the era five data were filtered to have the same length as the observations. And then the evaluation was made using graphical methods like plotting the time series and using quantile quantile plots and also statistical methods like the prison correlation coefficient and the least linear square feet. And this comparison was made with the wind speed, but also with the capacity factors. So to estimate the capacity factors, here is where we use the power curve of the wind turbine. Um, first, the wind speeds are converted to power by feeding to the power curve a polynomial. Then the wind speeds are evaluated in that polynomial. We get power, uh, with it, which is added for the whole year. And we have as a result, the annual energy produced. Then it is divided by the rated power, in this case, two megawatts and um, by the number of hours in the year. But this depends on the length of the time series. Like if the time series is complete, it will be 8,760 hours. So the key results from the comparison are that wind speeds obtained from era five appropriately reproduce the dynamic of the observations apart from the magnitude, meaning that the time series have a similar flow. Like for example, this is the time series of a site in Oaxaca. The, the blue line are the observations and the orange line are the era five data. So when the observations goes up, ERA-5 goes up to, and when it goes down, it happens the same. But ERA-5 tends to underestimate the wind speeds. And also there is an overestimation in five of the 30 sites. We can see it here in the quantile quantile plot. For example, this one is for Baja California Sur tree. It's a site, um, it's located in the north of Baja California. It's called Paya Tortugas. And here there is an overestimation for the values like between one and seven, then they are well represented and then it occurs the underestimation. And here um, also there is an overestimation, but for low values, then they are well represented and then there is an underestimation. So it's it is clear that it exists the bias and we apply bias correction to the data using the quantile mapping method. After applying it, the overestimated values decrease and the underestimated values increase. And the dynamic also was, as the beginning, well represented. Also, it improved the, the data distribution. This is, um, KD plot of the data before bias correction and after bias correction and after the bias correction, the linear less square feet, which is the, the red line is closely aligned to the identity line, which is the black line. This will be the ideal case that the era five wind speed are equal to the observations wind speed. Also, the bias correction has a considerable impact when calculating annual values. Uh, when we estimate the mean wind speed and the annual capacity factors with the era five data bias corrected, it, it, was, 
it is practically the same that with the observations. Here it is plot is for the capacity factories. The blue marks are the ones estimated with the observations. Orange with the ra 5 data without bias correction and green with bias correction. So the blue and the green markers have the almost the same values. And we can see also here what was commented before about the underestimation. Like without the bias correction, the markers are below the, the observations marker. But the case of Baja California Sur 3, that it occurs the overestimation at the beginning, the markers were above the observations. And then we used the, also the prison correlation coefficient to measure the degree of relationship between these, these variables, era five data and observations. And the values results goes between 0 0.8 39 in Baja California Sur 3 to 0 0.89 in Oaxaca. The weakest correlations happens for the sites located in Baja California Peninsula or Baja California Sur and in the Eje Neovolcánico. This is because here the the 30 kilometer grid, it's on the land, like it's on the continent, but it could be affected by the grid next to it that it's on the Pacific Ocean or on the Cortes Sea. And here in the center, the orography is complex because of all the mountains. So Era 5 struggles to represent it. Then the highest, uh, the strongest correlation occurs in Tamaulipas, in the sites in Tamaulipas, and the sites in Oaxaca and Chiapas. So from this sphere, we can highlight two aspects. The first is that the wind resource in Mexico is so diverse, just by seeing the time series, the data distributions, the mean wind speed, and the capacity factor values, they are all different, except for the ones that are near to each other. But well, we, I guess most of us, we live in this country where there are happening many things on it. We have many mountains, the Sierra Madre Oriental, Occidental, the Sur, the Egeo Volcanico. And then we also have this narrow piece of land in Baja California the isthmus with a high wind resource. Well, it's fascinating, the diversity, but this is what it is studied on the second sphere. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. But yes, a diverse wind resource in Mexico. And also that analysis data could be a valuable tool for wind resource assessment, but depends on the region and post-processing, like bias correction. Now moving to the second sphere, um, it is about analyzing the complementarity of the regional wind in Mexico. And it is important to assess the spatial and temporal correlation of wind resources because it is related to one of the mechanisms, as I comment in the beginning, one of the mechanisms to increase the flexibility grid that is expanding the generation area. So by interconnecting different sites we can, it is possible to reduce the variability. Like imagine that we have three sites and in one moment, one is generating and the other ones are not generating. Then happens a different time step, time step and this is not generating, this one is generating and this is, not, this is also generating. So if we interconnect them, we could have then this happen like again, then this is not generating, this is not generating, and this is generating. If we interconnect them, we could we could probably have like a, a constant generation. So knowing the wind characteristics could improve the wind reliability by planning the harvesting of the wind. 
the way we measure it, the interconnection potential was using again the Pearson correlation coefficient and the increase of generating hours. And here, the first sphere is the input because from it, we know that era five data is reliable and the observations time series that we have are from different years. So we cannot compare them because they might be occurring different, different things on each year. So we need the time series of the same year and we obtain them from era five um, for the 30th study sites because we have for them the bias correction found before. So we obtain the data from era five, but applying to it the bias correction. Now in the, the key results of this theory, and well, they are given in three scales. On a national scale, like the, the big picture of Mexico, then on a regional scale, I didn't mention this before, but it's because later in the project, when we include the demand, we use the, the electricity demand time series of the regions of the electrical nation, national system of Mexico, which is divided in, in nine regions. Seven are interconnected. Baja California and Baja California Sur are not interconnected. But yes, we, we prepare the data on regional time series for then um, see the relation of the generation and the demand. So it's national, regional, and also local because we have the time series of each site. So about the, the big picture of Mexico, um, for most of the regions, except in the Tehuantepec Isthmus, the highest capacity factors occur in a spring. In the Tehuantepec Isthmus, it occurs during summer, and the lowest capacity factor occurs during, no, no, sorry. The highest of the Tehuantepec Isthmus occurs during winter, and the lowest of all regions occurs during summer. And on a daily scale, the highest capacity factor, well, the capacity factor is start to increase around 2, 2 p.m. And then it is the highest between 6 p.m. and 1 a.m. and the lowest between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. And the range of the capacity, of the highest capacity factor is, is extensive because because it includes all the regions. That doesn't mean that all during these seven hours, all the regions are having their, their capacity factor like continuously. No, it's what it's happening is that like from six to eight, one region has high capacity factor, then from eight to 10, another region and so on. Some of them repeat, um, but this is really interesting because during these seven hours, we could we could take advantage of the highest capacity factors. And also during this time, like in the afternoon and night, is where the peak demand occurs in Mexico. Now on a, on a local scale, we have this heat map that I could stare at it for a half an hour. It has a lot of information. And it's the present correlation coefficient of each site with another site. Briefly, the blue squares show a strong correlation, which means that the wind power generation is similar. And yeah, we can see that those are are on the same region and some are sites that are close to each other. Like for example, the sites located in, in Zacatecas, in Tamaulipas. And then the red and dark orange square shows anti-correlation, which means that when one site has high capacity factory values, the other has 
low values or is not producing. So these are opportunity areas to complement between sites and regions. On a regional scale, we can see that the sites in the in the northeastern region, Oriental, uh, the sites located in Oaxaca and Chiapas could could complement east well a lot of regions, but for example, the northeastern region uh, with the sites of Tamaulipas or also the peninsula region, the sites located in Yucatan. Between sites of the same region, the lowest correlation occurred between Puebla and Guerrero. And between sites of different regions, an interesting case is Baja California Sur with Chihuahua, because this could motivate the interconnection of Baja California, Baja California Sur with the interconnected national system as, as Chihuahua and Baja California Sur could complement each other. And then these are the results of the of the number of generating hours and the number of generating hours um, I forgot to mention, but the cut in wind speed of the wind turbine is three meters per second. And we are not counting the hours that have a wind speed above three meters per second and that are generating. No, we're counting the hours that have a capacity factor above 0 0.2. And oh, before analyzing this heat map, I want to show you these box plots. These are the number of generating hours of each year for the period of 1979 to 2019, 41 years. And we can see here many things, but one of them is the increment of the, the, the increase of, of the generating hours by joining sites of the same regions. Like on this heat map, said that, well, they, they have a strong correlation, so they have a similar behavior. But even so, when we join it, join them, the hours increase. For example, in Tamaulipas, the values were between 4,500 and 6,000. And joining them, then the values increase up to 6,500. So yes, now on the regional scale, the di diagonal is the number of generating hours of each region, like the occidental. Occidental is the western. By its own, it has 6,529 hours. And whichever is the combination, like if we go up, down, left, right, the hours increase. We combine occidental, western with the northeastern, it increased to 8,187 values. And also about this plot, the number of generating hours is proportional to the wind resource, like the sites of Tamaulipas, um, here are two, two, two Ori, Ori and Ori 2. It's the Eastern region, because on this region that it's quite large, we have many sites, 11 sites. So we decided to divide it in two regions, one with the sites of Oaxaca and Chiapas, that it's Ori 2, and the other with the sites of Veracruz, Hidalgo, Puebla. Um, so yeah, the, the number of generating hours is proportional to the wind resource. Like we have a high wind resource in the northeastern region, in Ori and the peninsular, and also the percentage of increment 
depends on the wind resource. Like the regions with many hours on their own will not need massive, a massive quantity from the others. And also another interesting thing is, is that by joining two regions, we don't have 8,760 values. We need regionally at least four regions to have the complete year. So the general conclusions of this part of the project are that the performance of the analysis data is not uniform in Mexico. It depends, it depends on the local orography and global wind circulation patterns. And the sites best represented are located in Oaxaca, Chiapas, and Tamaulipas. Also, Reanalysis data could be a valuable tool to represent Mexico's wind potential, but it depends on the region and post processing La Paz correction. And the wind variability could decrease by combining the wind energy generation of different sites located across Mexico, and the potential of complementarity between regions is significant. But it is remarkable the importance of investing in electrical infra infrastructure in order to interconnect these different sites and regions. So yes, this is the last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lulu. So we have time for some questions. Um, yes, let's give her a huge applause. Can you uh, you can use your reactions in Zoom? So thank you very much, Lulu. So if anyone has a question, please feel free to raise your hand to open your microphone. Or if you want to drop a question in the chat, please do it. We have a couple of minutes. Okay, we have one question. Okay. Uh, we have a question from uh, Marco Antonio Rubio Ramos. How the new rules for electric generation should be considered using this approach? Well, that's an interesting question because I think the new rules are not considering this approach think that they should consider it like invest as i mentioned on the on the first on the electrical infrastructure and then use like maybe this kind of projects to see like first a wind resource assessment to see where it's convenient to detect the potential sites, and then these kind of studies that analyze the variability to see how they will affect and also like how interconnecting different regions, uh, this variability problem could decrease. Thank you, Lulu. We have another question from Osvaldo Ortega. Excellent uh, presentations, congratulations. My question is why? Are you using this bilinear interpolation in era five instead using something like cubic splines, by example? Um, well, I haven't heard about the cubic, the cubic that you mentioned, so it will be interesting to to try it. But we use the bilinear interpolation because the the domain the era five data that we download is like a rectangular prism and the base is measured with the latitudes and longitudes and then the the z axis is the time so as it's a mesh we use uh, the interpolation in a in a two-dimensional rectangular grid. Thank you, Lulu. I think we have a couple of minutes more for one more question. We have one in the chat from Emma Osuna. Hello, 
I am not sure I did not hear what was your bias correction method. Can you comment a little bit more, Lulu, please? Thank you. Sure. The, the bias correction method that we use is called the quantile mapping method. And I knew that this was going to be a question. So I prepare another slide for it. And you can see also the code that we use. So the quantile mapping method, what, what it is done on it is that we have the time series as they occur, like they begin on January, January 1st, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., they occur. And the first step is to, to group the data on, on percentiles. And, and we have from there these QQ plots, the first percentile of the era five wind speed and then of the observations. And then we subtract from the era five percentile the observations percentile. For example, this last one. In era five is 16, around 16. And in the observations is like, let's say 2022. So 16 minus 22 is minus six. And we save that value. This is the bias correction. And then we go back again with the time series as it happened, January 1st, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., as it happens. And we graph each value, for example, the first value. And this is 18 meters per second. So then we see in which quantile is this wind speed, 80 meters per second. It's on the last quantile. And we apply to it the bias correction value that we save. And by applying it is this value minus, this is the last step, minus the bias correction. So 18 minus, minus six is 24. And now the era five wind speed, it's like has a higher value and it's more similar to the one with the observations that we said that it's 20, Thank you, Lulu. Okay, so I think we have a little bit time for a, a one more question. Um, well, we have a couple of them. So the first one is, um, no, sorry, just one. Yeah. So hello, this question is from Paola Castolo. Hello, Lourdes. Thank you a lot for your presentation. My question is, how reliable are databases like AWS Tree Power, which is an online platform for wind casts around the world? AWS? Yes, AWS True Power. Um, well, I don't know AWS, but I think it will depend also like if it is obtained from models or from analysis data, it will depend also on the grid resolution. Like for example, ERA-5 has 30 kilometers and in 30 kilometers, there happen a lot of things. Then there is also a model called Weather Research and Forecasting, WRF, which resolution is one kilometer. And well, in one, it has a higher resolution. So yeah, I think it will depend on like the source of the information and also the, if it is model, the parameterizations and also the resolution. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I think that uh, we don't have any more questions. Thank you, Lulu. So everyone just uh, give uh, Lulu a big applause. 
Uh, virtual. Applause.